don't let the Spirit leave you and depart from you now. As we have an attitude of worship, let us go before His Word with reverence to understand Him better, that we may grow, conforming more to His image, that we may grow and do the works of Christ in the earth, becoming all God created us to be. Let us remember our bands of commitment. On the left arm, the one in which the heart is the side of conforming to the image of Christ. Let that be the desire of your heart every morning when you get up. I will conform to the image of Christ because that is the will of God. And then with your right hand, the hand that works are done, remember that Jesus said, and we have committed to doing the works of Christ. That as we conform and do, we become all God created us to be. I will share with you this morning more on how God's going to work with you and me. I was excited and delighted on Wednesday night when I gave you the message, a new sermon, that God has a plan and God has a place and a time to bless you. I will do everything I can to make that message available for those of you who are not here. But I would encourage you to seek to obtain it. Because indeed, I was tremendously blessed by what God gave to me about his plan for you and me. And about this place and this time. But today I want to talk about a calling on your life to do the works of Christ. I hope to make it all the way through uh, in time expeditiously so that you can get it all and, and I won't overwhelm you too much with a lot of material. But God has called you and me to do a work that glorifies him on the earth. He's called you and me to do a work that glorifies him on the earth. For this time, this generation, none of you are accidents. I don't care what your mama might have said or your daddy might have said. You might have been a whoop, there it is. But you are no accident in God's eyes. Because we've learned that he knew you before you were born. He knew you and he formed you in the womb. And he predestined you for a mission. He has a plan for you. This is the place. This is the time. You are the generation that God has called to bring forth in these last days his word in a powerful way. He has revealed things to me that you are not just simple people but you are a powerful people that the word will dwell within and God will operate through you. He will give you the ability to faithfully execute and to do his word as you allow him to live in you. I'm going to repeat this over and over and over again. God is alive and he should be alive in us. Listen, you know he is real You've seen the works of his hands. You have seen the stars, the awesomeness. You have seen the vastness of the universe. You know that there is a God. You have seen the meticulous works of his hand by the way the seasons, the tides, and all the universe follows a conformed order. This same God has also ordered your life. He has a plan for it. And he is working in you to will and to do his good pleasure. 
recognize he is alive. And if he's alive, keeping all of this universe working, he can keep you alive. No matter what the doctor has said to you, no matter what might be going around, sickness and disease, no matter what might be coming from China, might be coming from Russia, or even coming from Birmingham, your God is alive. And because he is alive, he keeps you alive. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. He must be alive on the inside of us. The more we let him live in us, the more the power of God is displayed in us. We need to know him not just in our minds, but in our hearts. He must be more than just a thought a figment of our imagination. He must be someone we walk with daily, someone that we commune with, that when we sit at a table, we recognize that Jesus sat with his disciples. He sits with us. Why do we sit at the table and ignore him, knowing that he is the one that has provided us the food that we're about to eat? We need to say, when I sit at this table, thank you, Jesus, because he's right there with us. He needs to be alive with us everywhere we go, on our job, in our cars, when we're filling up the gas tank, when we're talking to our friend, we need to know that he is with us. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Wherever you are, there I'll be. With a God like that, he deserves all our worship. He deserves our recognition. He is here, but he is not just in this church. He is with you wherever you go. So when you think you're going to the club, Remember, he's there with you. There are some places you ought not take the holy, holy, holy God of the universe. There are some things you ought not be doing with the holy, holy God of the universe right there with you. He needs to be alive. He wants us to experience a pure relationship with him. And today, I'm going to reveal to you how you can have a more powerful life. As the word of God becomes alive in you, giving you the ability to do far greater than what you've ever imagined, you think that you can do certain things, but you can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all the things you think when you have him by your side. And you recognize that he is with you. I want to cause you to to begin to See him with you, inside of you. Listen, as we learn from the word of truth, the things that we talked about last week. Remember Ephesians 2.10? And every one of y'all needs to get this through your head. I ain't playing what I'm talking about in 2020. We're going onward. In 2020, it would behoove every one of you to make sure you're in church every Sunday and you need to be here every Wednesday. Because I ain't playing. We're going somewhere with this. We're going onward. I need y'all to see it. And everyone that's grasping it, I need you to encourage everybody else, let's get onward and let's go on. Get on board and let's go onward. Because we need each other. God put us all in this place, this generation, this city, in this church together. We need each other. I need every one of you all to become all God created you to be. Because for all I know, you might be the one that God has anointed to lay hands on me when I'm sick. To speak a word of encouragement to me. You don't know who your Joseph is. You need to be encouraging everyone that's around you, that's in this church, that you come to know. And you need to come to know them all. Because in each one, you don't know how much God has put himself in that person to be a blessing to you. And for you to be a blessing to them, we must learn the true essence of, like I said in, in the other sermon, learning the, the reality of love. Remember I taught you that, the reality of the new birth and the reality of hate and the reality of love. That ain't going to never change. I'm giving you fundamentals of the truth. I know I can't give it all to you at one time, so let me, let me hold back. The scripture, for we, see the word we, we. We are his workmanship. 
I told you that we are God's masterpiece. Go look and see from the very beginning that everything he created in this universe was for one thing, for the man. And every one of you as being humans and men and women, you're, God, his, you're God's masterpiece. He created you. He formed you in the womb just the way he wanted you to be. He instilled in you certain things that he wants you to do. He knows what he wants for your life, and you need to come to know it. We are his workmanship, notice, created in Christ Jesus for what? Wake up, wake up, stay with me. We are his workmanship created in whom? For what? For what? Then say cussing nobody out. Then say rolling your eyes at nobody. You are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Think to yourself, I have been created for good works. God formed me in my mother's womb for good works. He has a plan for my life. He has predestined me to bring glory to him. Now, I want you to understand what you just said. God designed you. He has predestined you to bring glory to him. We are created for him, not ourselves. David said, we are the sheep of his pasture. He is the shepherd. We are not the shepherd. We have to learn to die to ourselves and allow Christ to reign in us. And if we do, our lives are going to be blessed lives. Some of us are catching hell. The reason we're catching hell is because we haven't connected with the one who gives us life. I'm here to tell you that if you've connected with Christ, guess what? You will have problems, but he will deliver you through them all. I'm here to tell you that if you connect with Christ, it all ain't going to be on top. Because sometimes he will lead you through the valleys and the shadow of death, but he will lead you. Didn't say he will leave you. And see, when you have Christ, you don't ever get so despondent that you believe, it ain't no reason for me to go on. No, you understand the Lord is my shepherd. You come to realize that he didn't create you and bring you into the world to let you just die here. He created you for you to thrive here, to be an instrument of his peace to be someone who will carry his message. You are an awesome people. You're not just black folk. You God's folk. You are more than what the world wants to label you. You are children of God. And the more you recognize this, when you have that vision before you that I'm a child of God, where there is a vision, the people thrive. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And I'm here to bring you the knowledge of the word so that you recognize who you are in Christ and that you become all that God created you to be. He created you in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. And let me tell you something. God ain't never done nothing and failed at it. God has never failed. And if God has prepared a work for you to do, you can do that work because God prepared it for you. What we got to do is to find out in the mind of God what it is that you created me for. And if you created me for this, nothing can stop me from accomplishing it. The reason why we see so many failures in life is because people are going about doing what they want to do and not what God created them for. Notice, he prepared beforehand works that they should do, that they should walk in. So many of us are experiencing miserable lives because we're not doing what we were made to do. You know, 
This is my hand. It is not a hammer. If I wanted to put a nail in a piece of wood, it would be foolish for me to hold the nail in this hand and to hammer it with this fist. As much as I might like to think I'm the incredible Hulk and can be able to pound that nail into that piece of wood, all I will do is damage myself because God didn't create me to be a hammer. Many of you have run about trying to pursue careers, doing what you wanted to do, and God never created you for that. And you're wondering why on that job, I can't stay in my job. Because you ain't doing what God told you. You catching hell from everybody else because God's trying to push you away from, from that job. Some of you need to be fired to go where God wants you to go. And if you get fired, don't worry about it because remember, he works all things out together for your good. Come on. He's prepared the work beforehand and that you should just simply notice we are his workmanship created for good works. But notice the phrase is that we should walk in them, not work in them. created for good works but we should walk in them we don't do the works we just walk in them I hope some of you can begin to get a recognition of what I'm talking about here. see when you're trying to do the work you can't do the work this competency is not of you this competency is of God I'm going to prove to you today that some of you just made your life so hard trying to get right, trying to do the right thing, when it ain't about what you're trying to do. It's about simply allowing him to work through you. That we should walk in it. Look at this. We are his workmanship. He's doing the work. We're not the workmanship. We don't do the work. I don't need to try to make myself do anything. I just need to let him get in me. And if he gets in me, he makes all that stuff happen. Remember Paul said, when I try not to sin, the more I sin. When Paul said, the sin that I don't want to do is the sin that I do. And what can I do? I don't want to do it, but I do it anyway because I'm trying not to do it. But if I will stop focusing on the sin and focus on him, he will work out the sin in my life. Work out the sin in my life. If I focus on him, because come on, if he is holy, 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 then sin can't dwell in the place where holy, holy, holy is. All I got to do is yield my life to him and let him continue working out my sin, my faults, my troubles, my problems, and then I can live and dwell in him. God help me to make this plain and simple. And if he's worked these things out beforehand, then all we have to do is walk in them it behooves us that we need to find out what did he prepare beforehand and how has he created us here's what Jesus said in John 14 12 most assuredly I say to you he who believes in me the works that I do he will do also notice that he says the works that he does we will do. See, it's not something wrong with me to think that I can do the works of Christ. I need to. You know, somebody think, oh, you just think you this. You ain't Jesus. No, I'm not Jesus. But guess what? Jesus dwells in me. I need to stop letting folk knock down Jesus that's inside of me. I need to let the Jesus in me be seen more. You know, I need to walk around, recognize that Jesus is in me and try to, to, to let him have more of my life. And when folk talk about you ain't holy, you know what? On my own, I ain't holy. But I remember the word of God, and you should remember the word of God, and I'll give it to you again, that those he has called, he has justified. So I don't care what you say about me. You can condemn me all you want, but God has justified me. No, I ain't perfect. But guess what? Way back on Calvary, somebody gave their life. 
that I might be able to have life and that I'd be justified now, righteous in the eyes of God because somebody paid the price for my wrongdoing. Back then, right now, and tomorrow. He said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. But here comes the the real thing that should cause us to open up our minds and greater works than these he will do. Greater works than what? He said, he who believes in me is going to do the works that I do. But you're going to do something greater because I go to the Father. You and I have been dumbed down to think we can't do it. We've been told all the stuff of the Bible has passed away. Now, help me understand this. If the God of the Bible back here could do all the works that he did through people that we read in the Bible, Joshua could go up against walls of Jericho and tell the folk just shout one day. (laughs) Go around the wall seven times quietly and then shout one time and the walls come down. If Joshua, just, just this again, could command the sun and the moon to stand still. The same God that did that is the same God that I understand that was back then the same God today and the same God tomorrow. If he could do that with Joshua, how can he do it with Joshua and can't do it with Jimmy? What was it about Joshua? If Moses could stand at the edge of the Red Sea and pray out to God, Lord, help us. He said, why are you calling me? Lift up your own hand. And when Moses lifted up his hand, the Red Sea parted. If God could do something like that with Moses, how come he can't do that with Jimmy? Because the God that was with Moses is the same God. And I heard him tell Moses that he was the I am, which meant that he ain't dead from back there. Because if I name his name, he was the I am back there. And guess what? Today, he is still the I am. And if he is the I am today, as he was the I am yesterday, and he allowed Joshua and Moses to do what they did, he can allow Jimmy to do what he wants him to do. And he can allow you to do whatever he has prepared for you to do. And even greater works. God ain't dead. He's alive. Let him live in you. And the more you let him live in you, the more power you will see works through you. You ain't got to do the work. You just got to walk in it. One day Israel was up on the mountain and the Philistines were on the other mountain. And this big, huge mammoth of a man came down, came down the valley and started coming up the other side. And he said, you puny little Israelites, y'all ain't nothing. Your God ain't nothing. I'm going to whip y'all tails. David, a little shepherd boy that wasn't thought of and was despised of by his whole family, even his daddy, didn't consider him worth nothing, happened to be out there bringing lunch to his brothers. He heard what this big bad giant was saying. And he said to his brother, hey, what's going to be done about this fool out here talking against us? Somebody need to go whip his butt. His brother tried to put him down like people your friends will try to do. Put you down and tell you when you start doing something for the glory of God, you better shut up. Who are you? Who are you to do anything? But guess what David did? Same thing you need to do. David stopped talking to his brother, started talking to somebody else and say, what will be done for the man that defeats this sorry thing that's out there? And the word got to the king. The king called David in and said, hey, what you talking about? David said, I'll whip his butt. The God that's in me is more powerful than the God that's in him. And then like the world tried to do to get you to put on this armor, they'll give you its education. The world will give you the finances and tell you this is what you're supposed to work with. No, uh-uh. you ain't supposed to work with that. They tried to put it on David. David had to take it off. Now, you know the end of the story. Here's what happened. Notice when you read the story that David ran towards that big hunk, hulk, giant of a man. 
He didn't have a weapon except his sling, and he, and he didn't have the, 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 the tools to, to knock the joker out with until he got down to the water that represents the word of God, and he pulled out the five smooth stones. He didn't know what he was going to do. What he had to do in order to defeat the giant, they said he ran towards him. He actually just walked Meaning, when I say ran, the same as walking towards what his destiny was. He ran. All we got to do is walk towards the work that God wants us to do. See, somebody had to defeat that giant. Everybody else was scared because they were looking to do it on their own power. But David said, I come at you in the name of the Lord. And he ran to where he was. We got to learn that we have to run. We have to walk toward what God wants us to do. And then when David took his sling, he, he slung it and it hit right in between the visor of the helmet that Goliath had. There was no way that David was that accurate. It was God who did it because he had walked in the work that God wanted him to do. God takes up the rest. All you got to do is present yourself before your giants. God will cause them to fall. He said, I'll deliver you from all your trials. People, you run from it because your friends, like your brother David's brother was, say, you can't handle this. Your doctor tell you you got cancer, you're going to die. See, you better stop, rec stop letting folks speak into your life. Let the one who lives in your life speak about your life. <laughs> the ability to do these words come through the power of God by the Holy Spirit and not by anything natural. There's nothing that you can do to make God's power work through you except get yourself out the way. They must be done by the Spirit. But understand this, I'm going to tell you again. God has called you and me to do a work for him. He's called us to do it. Now, let's go over our scripture that we've been dealing with. Now, and I want you all to know something. I told you, November and December, God drilled this into me. Morning, noon, and night these scriptures that we're fixing to look at in a minute. I know what I'm talking about. I know where we're going. And if I can get you to just be faithful enough, if you give me six months of diligent study, listening to the words God has given me, your life will be dramatically changed by the month of June. Well, I guess I should say, you've already given me January, but you got a whole fact. Maybe you need to make the commitment now. Give me till July. And if you don't see the hand of God, you don't see the hand of God working in your life in the next six months, find you another church. I am so confident of what I'm saying right now. That if you will be diligent enough to be faithful, to follow what I'm showing, I mean, not just let it get in here, but get it in here. I'm already excited about what God has shown me. Oh, I'm so just, oh, I'm so caught up. I ain't scared of nothing no more. You, you, and you people already know, I told y'all. You remember in September, I told you we had a debt we got to pay at the end of, of, of February? Oh, yeah, we've been moving on up. We've been moving on up. Praise God for what he's doing through you. And see, another thing, let me tell you, to get us and get us completely out of debt, my prayers are that every one of you all, if you do what I'm telling you to do, you're going to see increases in your life because somebody got to pay for this building and I can't pay for it. So it's got to come from folk that God going to be doing work in out there with your raises, your blessings, with your, even if your lottery winning, I don't know how it did, or maybe it's your one arm bandit, some kind of way. All this stuff going to be taken care of. Oh yeah, you can see that, you can understand that. But let me tell you, here are the scriptures I want us to look at. We're going to go over them just a little bit. Romans 8, 28, 29, I'm sorry. Romans 8, 29, which 28 precedes the 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, which means you. He predestined. This is again, as we just read up there in the other scripture in Ephesians 2, 10. Beforehand, he said he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. 
that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. See, God has something in you conforming to the image of Christ. He said that he might be the firstborn of many. Notice this, predestined that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants me conformed to the image of Christ. He wants you conformed to the image of Christ. Why does he want that? Because he wants Jesus to be the firstborn of many. So God is concerned and he's going to work in you so that you conform more daily to the image of his son so that his son has many brethren. God wants him to have many brethren, including you. All you got to do is get out the way and let God do what God wants to do. And stop trying to run your own life. And that's a hard thing to do. Verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. That's the word that God has called you and me to do a work for him. But notice in doing this, those he called, he said, these he also justified. See, he had to do that. See, God had to call you, but God can't call stinking, nasty, evil people. You can't do no work for God. So God, knowing that you can't stop yourself from being stinking and nasty, you know, it's like you out, you've been out on the street 365 days. The only bath you had was the rain that you ran from. And the only way you can get clean is that God cleans you up. You got to stop trying to do it. You got to let him do it. So he says that those, notice this, those that he foreknew, he predestined and he called and he called them, he justified them when he called them. So could nobody say nothing about them because God justified them. I want you to understand that when God has called you and justified you, the world going to hate you. Because they don't want you called to God. Because they don't want to be called to God. They don't want to do the work. But I'll, I'll get to that later. Let me just keep going on. Oh, help me, Lord, please. He justified, and whom he justified, these he also, notice this last word, he glorified. See, when I was born into the world, I was already predestined for works that God prepared for me to do before I was born, beforehand. And he knew I would screw up in life. He knew I would do some bad things. He knew that I'd I carried mace to school and folk would spray the mace in the classroom. He knew that I would be a killer of cats in my early life. He knew that I would say the wrong word when I touched the lamp. He knew I would do a lot of wrong. He knew I'd have a child out of wedlock. But he called me, and when he called me, he justified me. And when he justified me, he took the board and the book that my name was written, and he wrote out, he erased all the bad that I had already done when he called me because he justified me. And then because he's omniscient and he knows everything, he knew what I was going to do in the future. And you know what? He went below the line of what was past. He went into the future and erased all the things that I will do tomorrow. I have been justified just like you have been justified because God has called you to a glorified state and you can't get there unless you've been justified. The world don't want you to know that you've been justified because the world going to say, you can't do it because of this, you can't do it. No, you can't. Ain't nothing possible for you to do it, but all things can be done by God. Now, understand this. Before you were born, God had already written out your life story. He had a plan for you. I taught you that on Wednesday. And if you weren't here on Wednesday, like I said, you need to get that message. And you need to get in line with it. He'll give you the ability to do the very works of Christ and bring glory to his name and a tremendous abundance in your life right now and in the world to come a rich inheritance of things also prepared for you before the creation of the world let's talk about the reality of the new birth how did God do it how did he justify you what happened the reality of how it was done he recreated you see you were born stanky like being out in the street you were messed up but God recreated you if any man is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. You were born again as a child of God, and you inherited the rights and privileges of a child of God. However, when you were born again, here's what everyone needs to understand. You were born as a baby, just like when you're born in the world, you're born as a baby. When you were born again, you were born as a child in the Spirit of God. And as you had to learn to grow up in the natural world, you got to grow up in the spiritual world. You just don't come down in front of a church and say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then you can go back and you can cast out demons and you can start laying hands on the sick and they're going to recover. No, you got to mature to be able to do that. You can go around talking about, how you doing today? Oh, blessed and highly favored. You just joined church yesterday. You ain't studying his word. You ain't, got you ain't blessed and highly favored. You can be blessed and highly favored. But you haven't matured to the point. You can't even handle the blessings of God. Because just as soon as God bless you with more money, you rob him in the tithe. You ain't ready to be blessed. As soon as you get the car, you're driving to the club. And as soon as you get your health back, you're up on the pole again. You ain't ready until you mature to know how to use what God has blessed you with. God don't bless some of you because he know if he did, you'd act a bigger fool than what you're doing now. He said, God, give me, give me, give me. You can't handle what I give you. You got to grow up. Yesterday, I went out into the garage. SJ was following him behind me. And uh, his mama and his daddy, you know, Adrian drive a GMC something. And Matt drive a GMC. His is bigger than hers. And they bought SJ a GMC plastic truck that runs on batteries. So SJ and Adrian and Matt can have their black trucks parked outside. So I told SJ, I'm going out to the garage. I got to get something out of my car. He said, well, I'm going to my car. <laughs> he followed in behind me. And I went to the side of where my car was. And he was going around the back. Where are you going? He said, I'm going to my car. Because <laughs> his car was on the other side. Now, just like their desires to give him something like they have. Now, it's a toy. But when SJ gets older, no doubt his mama and daddy will withhold no good thing from him as he is maturing to be able to handle it. There are things that God can do and that he has done that he wants to give you the ability to do, but because you are not mature enough to handle it, he can't give it to you yet. He might give you some toy semblance of what it is, you might be able to go lay hands on one or two people and they recover. But the full power of total recovery like Christ might be held back until you mature because if you get certain powers of God too early, you get the big head. You go out prophet lying instead of prophesying. You have to learn to grow up in the word. He's not going to withhold any good thing from you in that he gave his only begotten son so that you would have life. No good thing is God going to withhold from you and me. Just like Adrian and Matt gave SJ a car, God has given some of you all a few little blessings and you run around in your toy car talking about how blessed and highly favored you are. And God really got a real Mercedes for you, but you satisfied in your little push car. I ain't satisfied till I get all God got for me, till I become all God created me to be. And I want that fire to be in every one of you all, that you won't settle for just a little bit. You go for all you can get from God. And I assure you, the more you pull from him, if you keep pulling, God's going to give more and more to you. You know? There was a king, and, I, and you know, I believe I can tell you these stories because I've taught you these stories, and then they put people tell me, bitch, everybody don't know the stories you taught us over the years. Well, it's not my fault. 
But there was this king that was in trouble. And the man of God came to him and said, look, I came so that you can get deliverance. And he went to the king and he said, now, I tell you what, I want you to shoot an arrow out your window. And he got the bow and he held the bow and he told the king, take your bow and your, and, and your arrow. And, he, and, the, and the prophet, the man of God, put his hand on the king's hand on the bow. He put his hand on the king's hand back on the string. And he pulled it back. And he said, now, let it go. The prophet and the man of God, the, the prophet, the man of God, and the king, and the arrow went out. He said, that's the arrow of the Lord that's going to defeat your enemies. All right. And he said, now I want you to take some arrows, and I want you to strike the ground. And he took those arrows, and he struck the ground. And the prophet was upset with him. He said, I just told you that God is working through you. All you did was strike the ground three times. But if you had struck the ground viciously and you had hit it hard, then you would have utterly destroyed your enemies. I'm trying to show you that God was working through you when I put my hand on you. I'm trying to show you the only reason you don't have everything that you want is because you have not, you have not aggressively pursued doing what God has already told you to do. Hear me. God has so much more for us, but we're not faithful in coming to church. We're not faithful in reading this word. We're not faithful in speaking this word. We're not faithful in talking to other people about him. Why should he give us more? If you're not faithful in a few things, why should I give you more stuff? If you want more stuff, then you need to be witnessing to other people about Christ. You need to be walking like Christ. You need to be doing what God has called you to do with what you already know. Don't need to be sitting up listening to other folk talking about nasty things they're going to do, wrong things they're going to do, cussing out other folk. Yeah, good, I'd cuss them out too. No! If you can't act like a child of God with what you already know, why should he give you more so you can exalt your own self? Now, if you choose to remain immature, not seeking to grow in God's word, but rather choosing the things of the world and not take the time to understand his truth, even though you have the rights of a child of God and the authority of a child of God, if you continue to remain immature, you'll never experience. You know what the Lord said, study to show yourself, yeah. approves, yeah. rightly divine the word of God, so you not be ashamed. Many of us folk going to get to heaven. And I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear from you. Now, Jim, you could have done this. You could have achieved this. You could have achieved this. But you weren't faithful enough. How many of you want to get before the Father and he tell you, you could have had that blessing. You could have overcome that problem. But you didn't dedicate yourself enough to me you can't defeat no devils but if you had allowed me to dwell richly in you I would have knocked out every demon and every devil that tried to come in your life we keep trying to fight fights when all we need to do is go to our dad tell you another thing SJ does Slow down. We were in the bed yesterday, SJ and I, and we were tussling. And I got tired of him. And he's getting the pill and he's, hey, hey, Papa, 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 Papa. SJ, come on, I'm tired. <laughs> so I just grabbed him and I held him and I wouldn't let him move. He said, okay, come on, Papa. Come on, Papa. I ain't letting you go. You want to start jumping on me? I don't want to let you go. Papa, come on. Papa, come on now. You know what the next thing that low down thing did? He said, Gigi! Gigi! Calling that one right there. Gigi, Papa won't let me go! You little yellow. 
and she coming in. What's going on, SJ? What you need? Papa! Papa! Let SJ go. <laughs> on SJ <laughs> while he was trying to tussle with me there wasn't no way he was going to break away from my hole but he did what every young child and every child of God should learn to do don't worry about what folk doing <laughs> to you what you say call Gigi <laughs> call great God <laughs> Gigi I mean, you know, it made me mad. <laughs> and then, then trust the star laugh. <laughs> you know, let me keep going on. I got to get to the essence of the message right here. Let me explain from the following how we're going to accomplish the greater things that we've ever imagined accomplished. Now, watch this. I got to show you this. And once I do this, I'll I'll move on swiftly to as swift as I can. John 14, verse 10. Now, there's more. And like I already told you, I'm going to be sending out notes, you guys. I'm working on that now. Those of you that want to get the notes, you've already logged into the system. I'm behind. I'm behind four weeks. But you're going to get a whole bunch, a batch of material in just a little while. If you've logged into the system, GLC free, you know, if you've done that, the uh, uh, Wi-Fi you're going to get all my notes. But John 14, 10, now watch this. Now, here we go. This is what we're going to do. We're going to focus on this for the next few minutes. Do not believe, do you not believe that this, I am in the Father and the Father in me, Jesus questions. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. In other words, what Jesus is saying, if you look at this and you look at verse 10 again, he said, he didn't say he did any work. He says, the Father who dwells in me does the works. Now you remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus about the works that he was doing. Nicodemus wanted to know how he was doing the works. Remember I taught you that a couple of Sundays ago. Yeah. Told y'all you better keep up with me because God's controlling this whole thing. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed about how stuff I'm teaching. He's saying I told you that two weeks ago and I can come back and tell you but I didn't realize he was doing it then. John 3 2. Nicodemus, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs. That means these, these works that you do unless God is with him. Now, because what he wants to know is how do you do this stuff? And Jesus answered and said to him, he answered the question before Nicodemus had a whole lot to ask. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was talking about the signs Jesus was doing. And Jesus informed him that those signs, the works that you've seen me do, cannot be done by a person unless they are born again. Because it's not the person that's going to do them. It's the one that's inside of the person that's going to do them. Now, if Jesus couldn't do anything except God did them for, for him, you can't do nothing except God does it for you. Amen. And then he said in John 3, 5, Jesus answered when Nicodemus said, hey, can I go back in my mother's womb? See, that's how the blinded world is. They can't see. And Jesus answered, most assured to you, I said that unless one is born of the water, which is representing the written word, and the spirit, which represents the spoken word. Now, see, here's what God's going to get you to, and I'll teach you this on a few weeks as we go along. The written word is what you're reading every day. The spoken word is what the Holy Spirit says to you when you read the written word. The spoken word is the Holy Spirit that speaks to you in the middle of the night and wakes you up with an answer to a problem that you couldn't solve. 
You see, God wants to speak to you from his written word and his Holy Spirit, which is the spoken word. And he said, unless one is born of water, representing the written word, and born of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is the reality of the new birth that I talked to you about two weeks ago. It's given to all who believe on his name, the power to become children of God, being recreated so that God can dwell on the inside of you, dwelling mightily on the inside. He says, but as many as who received him, Jesus said that those who believe in my name, the works that I do, remember what we just read a few minutes ago? He said, those who believe on my name, the works that I do, he shall do also and greater works. Because the Bible says in John 1, 12, he says that as many as received him, believed in him, he gave the right to become a power of God. How am I going to do the works of Christ? I do the works of Christ when God dwells in me and I'm his child. And just like he did the works through Jesus, he'll do the works through you and me. Oh, I need you to get this. I'm going to be hitting it again and again and again, but the sooner you get it, the more power you can get because you have a revelation of it. So now let's read this thing again, with Jesus, how Jesus said he did the works. We're going to read it in another place where he says, and in, in, in this is in, this is John, no, back the same place, John 14, 10. Look at what he said, John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father? Now watch me closely right now. And the Father in me. What are his words? I am in the Father and the Father in me. See, it? read it again. I am in the Father and the Father in me. And he said, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. It's the Father in me doing the works. Then verse 11, now watch this. Believe me that, now notice what he says here, the same thing, Dorothy, Elder Bray, talk about I repeat myself. Look at verse 11. He say, I am in the Father, and the Father in me. That's in verse 11. Go back to verse 10. See the same words, I am in the Father, and Father in me. So my two beautiful sisters that like to complain that I repeat myself. It looks as if Jesus repeats himself also. He repeats it because it's important for us to understand something. He says, I'm in the Father and the Father in me. And because the Father dwells in me, it's the Father who does the work, not me. It's the Father who's in me. I'm in the Father and the Father's in me and he does the work. Nicodemus say, how you do it? He said, you can't do it unless you're born again. Look, you can't see the power of God working in you unless you're born again. Unless you're born again as a child of God. Some of you ain't children of God. You church members, but you ain't children of God. So we see the repetition of I am in the Father and the Father in me. It's important that we see that I am in the Father and the Father in me. It was the Father doing the work. I'm repeating it again. It wasn't Jesus that did it. See, Jesus was just a lump of flesh that God had invested himself in. Jesus was a man just like you and me, you know. But he couldn't do nothing of his own because he was a man. But it was the Father that dwelled in him. The same Father that can dwell in you. Why do we only hear about Jesus after 30 some years doing the works that he did? We read about him when he was 12 years old. He was in the temple and he was talking to the rabbis there in the temple. But you don't hear about any works that he did until the first work at a wedding at Cana. Why don't we hear any works before then? I put it to you that Jesus was born just like a man with the Spirit of God inside of him. And he had to allow the Holy Spirit to develop in him. Remember, he's acquainted with our griefs. He's experienced everything we've experienced. What Jesus knew was that he'd been predestined. 
He knew that he had been called. He knew that he had been justified. And all he did was allow the Spirit of God to matriculate on the inside of him. So as a man, he became more than a man because the Spirit of God lived in him. And all who believe have the same ability. He said, well, these are those that are the type that hear the word and with perseverance and no, noble heart, the word produces 30, some 60, some 100 fold. To understand this, God has been sowing his word in every one of you all. And as I speak to you, I'm sowing his word in you now. Some of you are going to allow the Holy Spirit to develop more in you, just like Christ did. And he dwells in you and lives. Some of you will begin to see the return of some will get zero return because you won't allow him to grow. And these are those that the cares of the world choke out the word so it can't be productive. But some of you are going to develop 30, some of you 60, and some of you 100 fold. It all comes from the word of God. When Jesus was in the temple talking to them, it was the word that he was speaking of. Y'all better understand me. I'm giving you the message for the rest of the year and the rest of your dead gum lives. It's the power of God that dwells in you. But let me, let me finish, finish it up because I said I was going to do this like this now. So let's look at verse 12. We read this one now. Believe me now, verse 12. I say to you, oh, no, no, I need to do this. Yes, yes, uh, that's it, 12. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. He's the same God. He ain't no liar. He said you can do the same thing. And greater works than these he'll do because I go to the Father. And then he says, verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified. Mm, wait a minute, understand? In Romans, we just read 830, that those whom he has called, he has justified, and those he has justified, he has glorified. So we connect the words up and we begin to understand that the more God works in us, the more the power of God flows through us, the more quickly we move to our glorified state. Now how can we do the works? Watch this. How can it be possible that we could do greater works than him? With us, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So we go, we're reading from John 14th chapter. Let's just scurry on down to John the 15th chapter. And we find right there in the fourth verse, Jesus says something that we need to see. He says, abide in me and I in you. Now that should sound vaguely familiar. He said, you abide in me and I in you. Like he said, the father's in me and I in him. Notice the same consistency here. Abide in me and I in you. As he said, the Father in me and I in the Father. Oh, he's telling us something here. But watch further as we go along. He says, as the branch cannot bear fruit, that is, produce the work of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I can't do nothing, Jesus said, unless I abide in the Father and the Father abide in me. And it's the Father that does the work. Now, if you abide in me and I abide in you, then you will produce much fruit. The ability to do things is contingent upon your ability to allow God to dwell on the inside of you. Some of y'all have shut the door on God. He, that's the reason he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yeah, yeah. Because some of y'all have shut the door. Some Christians have shut the door. I have gone this far, but I'm not going no farther. That sister girl, I don't like her and she don't like me. And I'm going to love everybody else but that one. And Jesus is still knocking at the door. Someone's knocking at the door. That's the Beatles. That ain't Motown. Now, 
Verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. Uh-oh, he's repeating that same thing. Don't want that. He's repeating it. This part about abiding in him and, 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 and us in him, the Father in him and him in the Father. The verse 6. He said, well, he said, you can't do nothing without me. He can't do nothing without the Father abiding in him and him abiding in the Father. What makes you think you can do something without him abiding in you and you in him? The reason why you're catching so much hell and why life is so hard for you because you ain't abiding in him and him abiding in you so he can do the work that you need to get done. He said, if you seek first my kingdom, everything else you're working so hard and laboring for will be given to you. You know, one of the things I did when I came before you in September and told you we need $600,000, we got four hundred dollars as it is right now. And I got another plan. I see how we're going to wind up with another 100000 by the, before the end of this month. And another one's coming from somewhere. I don't know where it's coming from. But you know what? I'm not worried about it because I know that all I got to do is to get in him and let him get in me. And the work that we need to get the money that we need to do, some kind of way, it's going to be him that's going to do it and not me. I already told you that the value of our land is found out. It went up 10 to, no, it went up, what was it? Three to 10 times more than what we thought it was worth. Oh, yeah, that's happening. There's a bunch of other stuff going on that y'all don't know. We've gotten contributions from some other sources that I wasn't expecting to come. In. Not just you. It's God doing it. He did it all the other times and where he brought us back from last time, all them other times, somebody need to hold a mule for a minute. But let me tell you something. We have to always remain faithful, keep doing all that we can. God does all the rest. But all we got to do is get more in him. He said, you can't produce no fruit. You can't do nothing without me. But look at verse 6 now. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is with it. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Now, we got to realize what he's telling us here. He's telling us that we got to live in him and he's got to live in us. How do we live in him? We live in him in the word of God. And we have to learn to exclude all the challenges to the word sovereignty. We got to stop letting this mind tell us how to think and let this mind that is in Christ Jesus lead our lives. Just like we need food. We need water and we need air to live. We need God's word more than we need food, water, and air. Because I'm telling you, God's word, with God's word, you can be in a desert, ain't got no food, and God will bring manna from heaven. You can be in a desert, ain't got no water. Oh, let me tell you, you can be in a desert, ain't got no food. He'll send the, the, the ravens to bring you food. Got no water. He'll take you to a rock and say, speak to the rock. And the water will pour forth out of the rock. All you need is to focus on God and getting Jesus on the inside. Every one of you God like people. You're the ones I'm responsible for. You're the ones I'm supposed to bring the message to. And everyone else that might be watching by way of YouTube or Facebook, understand, I consider you one too. If you listen to me, you want to know, you write it, you put it in there, and I'll answer your questions also. Because God has given me more than I need to imagine that I have. We got a seat to eat every day. We need to eat his word. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So every day, it looks like every one of us, including myself, we always got to sit down somewhere at a table, and even if it's just a McDonald's, Big Mac, we eating something every day. We eating all the time. But when it comes down to the word of God, I gave you all something to read over every day. And what happened? Some of y'all starving. Some of y'all ain't had no nourishment since the, the first week. 
and you wondering how you're going to have strength to cast out devils. Devil ain't worried about you. He just come by. You fall down. All the devil got to do is threaten you. I'm going to take your job. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Thereby, notice, notice, desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. Understand this. It's God's word that you need to be into. It's simply that. See, you get in the word, and the word gets in you by the Holy Spirit. See, you've been born again. See, you justified that that word can get in you now. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's more than just reading the Bible. You need to recognize when you read that thing, take your time, eat that thing. Jeremiah said, I tasted that scroll and was something sweet. See, what I want you to understand is you get in the word. If you get in the word, you start looking at that word after a while. You start thinking about what God has done. When I, like when I read this morning that, that we should walk in them. I hadn't seen that before. Not that, we don't have to work towards it. We just walk. Ask Peter. Peter walking along the street. Folk want to be healed. Heal me. Heal me, Peter. Peter ain't got time to heal everybody. He just passed by him and let his shadow do it. God working through you. A woman with the issue of blood, how did she get healed? She just said, let me just touch the hem of his garment. Jesus didn't have to say, oh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, sister, I lay hands on you, and I declare that filthy, foul spirit that's in you, that's kept you bleeding these 12 years, come on! It was the Father that did the work. I'm sorry. Do like some of y'all doing right now. Let me hurry up. I'm going to quit. That's what I'm going to do. I quit. That's it. <laughs>